Hi, I'm Dr. Teresa Pazionis from Temple University Hospital. So we're going to be talking about robotic spine surgery and artificial intelligence, current practice and future directions. So you might wonder what, uh, what purpose robotic serves, given that you can use augmented reality, you can use fluoroscopy. There's lots of different ways to do the same job, but the key thing is that we're performing good patient care and getting good sagittal parameters, correcting our deformity, and making sure that we minimize fluoroscopy in the OR. Okay, these are my disclosures. So why robotic spine surgery? So robotic navigation has become increasingly mainstream in spinal deformity surgery as a tool to plan surgical technique and deformity correction and to generate spine surgery to improve efficiency and accuracy of implant placement and to limit radiation used in the operating room. There's been an increasing role within the datification of spine surgery as well, and the robot also acts as a tool to allow us to collect data, analyze it, and perform um, a, a good uh, analysis for patient outcomes. Following precise steps to optimize use and ensure safety are critical to introducing robotic navigation into surgical practice. So why is enabling technology and data important? Um, robotic navigation is a structured planning platform, and there's a potential to predict patient outcomes and optimize surgical planning using predictive analytics, radiomics, and AI. Evolving understanding of the importance of optimal alignment leads to the need to improve surgical planning and technique. And the role for personalized implants and precise surgical planning matches goals with off-the-shelf implants. However, it allows for more precise deformity correction with uh, greater datification of spine. So how do we describe this? Uh, th we've had multiple different iterations of um, describing sagittal parameters uh, in spine surgery, uh, initially starting off with Escher-Schwab and then proceeding through GAP, Rousselli classifications, et cetera. The key thing is that the more the patients are corrected to their optimal alignment, the better their function is going to be after surgery and the lower revision rates. We see that achieving target alignments in ASD surgery is actually challenging. So of patients who have had spine surgery with state-of-the-art spine surgeons uh, with AO spine and ISSG, we're seeing that the PILL goals have only actually been met in a very small percentage of patients. So zero to five is 31.5%, and we are misaligning by more than 15 degrees almost the same number, 30.45%. So among the 266 complex adult spine patients, the goal was met in 54.2% of cases only. Sagittal alignment really does matter. It's the dominant radiographic predictor of patient outcomes. If you achieve harmonious alignment, that's going to be the key for a successful spinal deformity correction surgery. Patients possessing postoperative spinal pelvic parameters within the normative ranges will exhibit improved patient outcome scores. And one of the risks of not achieving optimal alignment is revision spine surgery, which yields to increased costs to the health system and to the patient themselves. Similarly, coronal alignment also matters. We can see that a coronal malalignment, um, more than 30 millimeters, was significantly associated with a higher frequency of rod fracture and therefore potential re um, revisions. And residual GCM greater than three centimeters was also associated with worse SRS-22 scores for appearance and satisfaction. Um, malalignment also um, increases mechanical complications like PJK, PJF, and rod fracture, so higher rates of prone laterals perhaps. Um, but retrospective cohort studies of these 762 patients showed that radiographic complications had the most impact on both ODI and SRS scores. It's not just deformity. Degenerative cases are the most of what uh, spine surgeons will do in their practice, um, for the most part. And revision probability increases by 10 times if the sagittal alignment is not achieved during the primary surgery. Meta-analysis of over 1,000 patients showed a strong association between spinal malalignment and the development of adjacent level pathology. And we can see here that not only are we not correcting patients, but we are actively making them worse. We can see here preoperatively um, those who were aligned, 63.5%, remained aligned postoperatively, but unfortunately we've also uh, malaligned 6.6% of patients in this study, which is kind of a never event. So the clinical rationale here is more than 20% of patients are going to require revision spine surgery with a cost of adverse events of up to 147,000 and 74 days of hospitalization. We care about patient outcomes uh, as our number one uh, reason for doing the job that we do, but hospitals uh, also have the goal of generating revenue and saving money. And ultimately, if the hospital shuts down, we can't provide care to anyone. So the cost of care will increase by 48% with baby boomers aging, and um, this is compared to 2014 estimates. We can see that this is getting a lot worse, and it's going to become increasingly relevant that we contain costs. So can we do better? So improve the attention to detail. If you just do a good job, patients will do better, but that's harder than you think. 
standardization and data-driven surgery, which is using robotics and using other structured planning platforms. It also reduces the cognitive and ergonomic load of surgery if you use robotics. If you have to instrument T2 to pelvis, that's a lot easier to do properly with a robot than it is to do freehand. And you can focus more on the planning and the sagittal correction and the alignment versus making sure that you don't get a medial breach, although that is still also very important. Predictive analytics are also going to become more important um, a tool in spine surgeries we're going to see later in this talk. So how do we get good at this? We've all put in our reps with learning spine surgery and becoming competent in our trade. However, what robotics is really a different tool, um, and we also have to become competent using different technologies. So we see here that there's uh, the 10,000 hour rule that we talk about, and surgeon experience really does matter. The more experience we have, the less complications we'll get. We have common interoperative complications such as durotomies, nerve root injuries, wrong level exposures. Um, these are going to be reduced for robotics, and it's still important to understand that the robot is a tool and is a, an augment to appropriate surgical technique. Surgeon years of experience is a significant factor in mitigating neurologic complications, uh, and multiple publications confirm that experience, training, and attention to detail matters the most. So why should we use robotics in that case? So we see here that a high degree of accuracy of pedicle screw placement is achieved by the majority of surgeons. But for those of us who are in training institutions, the robot can actually act as an extra safeguard uh, for patient training that allows our residents to train effectively without compromising patient care. Um, learning curves in robotics, however, are still something that we need to be mindful of, and training both the surgeon and the appropriate team is important. So we, here we have a photo of uh, my team and my residents, and uh, so we have Bob and Velma there and Melissa who ended up doing trauma surgery, although I really wanted her to do spine. Um, we did an eight-hour surgeon training, four-hour staff in service, and continue training as the program progresses. Um, I actually brought my team to Globus about four or five times to ensure that they understood how the robot used. Um, there's a study by Pennington et al. that looks uh, the, at the team learning curve being 25 to 30 cases for excellen excellency. However, the proficiency can be achieved after the first three cases. And we made sure that we got those reps in prior to actually operating on any patients. So improving efficiency and accuracy is really important. Uh, generally, it's between 5 to 15% of pedicle screws are malpositioned freehand. Um, that does go down with experience uh, and service. However, the robotic navigation group was still slightly better than the freehand group in this study. Um, in my opinion, for conventional anatomy, open surgery is not a huge difference. However, for minimally invasive surgery, deformity surgery, or revision surgery, that's where the robot really shines in terms of uh, decreasing the radiation reduction and increasing the um, accuracy of screw placement. You can see here power versus manual. Um, the uh, conclusion here was this was the first multi-center study for power pedicle preparation, and 99.9% .9 of screws can be placed safely with the robot. How about efficiency? With setting up the robot, any interoperative spins that you may perform and things like this, we noticed that screw insertion and OR time were actually approximately the same. However, fluoroscopy time was significantly shorter, and this is really important. Um, the rate of breast cancer in female orthopedic surgeons is actually eight times the general population. We've all had colleagues who have had uh, thyroid cancers, lymphomas, cataracts. So reducing radiation exposure is really important for occupational health as well as to reduce radiation to our patients. So considerations for those surgeons who are assigned female at birth. Um, I've actually am one of the co-founders of our National Women's Spine Society, so this is something we talk about quite a bit. Um, there's a risk for breast cancer, risks to radiation in the developing fetus, uh, increased rates of carpal tunnel syndrome with pregnancy, although with everybody, we, we could all use better ergonomics. And robotics has many tangible benefits to surgical planning and patient outcomes, but also contributes to surgeon longevity. So it's good for the patients and it's good for us. The next benefit is personalized spine surgery. So as we generate more data, we're able to really tailor implants to patients to make sure that we get those parameters correct. And the datification of spine surgery and the collective use of planning platforms yields the ability to do this. Um, so it's not about screw placement, it's about the data, essentially. So why does data-driven surgery matter? Every patient is different and represents a unique combination of spinal pathology, frailty, and disability in social circumstance. Every surgeon is different, and essentially what you want to do is plan something that works both for you and the patient and gives them the best outcomes. So my prior life, uh, prior to medicine, was actually in economics. So economic forecasting is essentially changing one variable and seeing how it's going to affect the entire um, population, interest rates, whether or not somebody's going to buy a house. Interestingly enough, we can actually do the same thing with spine surgery. So 
there's something called a digital twin concept. So once we generate enough data using um, robotic planning platforms or any other structured platforms, you can essentially uh, create a digital twin, enter all the same inputs, sagittal parameters, frailty, looking at Hounsfield units, and see how well your patient is going to do with a selected surgery. And that's the recognition that not every patient is going to need the same surgery or do just as well with the same surgery for the same anatomic pathology. We look at a few things, and this is just more getting into the concept of digital twins, and this is the future application of this. So physical state, observational data, what inputs you enter, um, as well as the quantities of interest. So the foundations in future direction. So the efforts to date, we are liking to optimize and construct this construct infusion, make sure the patient fuses and fuses in the correct position, um, enhanced recovery pathways, and track surgeon outcomes over time. How am I doing? Am I actually getting 20 degrees of lordosis with my t lift at L5-S1? Even if I double stack cages, I'm probably not doing that, right? So being honest about our own outcomes is a really important step. Future is we're going to simulate digital twins. We're going to look at the impact of different surgeries, prehab, patient biology, timing, and um, update the twins as time goes on. Um, there's been a number of studies uh, through Chris Ames's group and other groups that looks at something called the intelligence-based spine care model, where you have a variety of inputs that creates a model that uh, may one day be highly impactful um, in the world of spine care for reducing um, the impact of uh, spinal pathology on people by performing appropriate surgeries that's tailored to each patient. Um, so these are uh, credit, slide credit from my mentor, Dr. Ames. So it looks at uh, how the surgeon sees it is there's a patient with these frailty scores and these preoperative scores. How the machine sees it is there's an infinite number of input markers that can influence that patient. And essentially, if we have enough patients, somebody's going to be similar. So our nearest neighbor AI recall will allow you to look at different patients who have had a similar surgery to that which you're planning and allow you to plan surgeries better given the patient anatomy and physiology. So what is one thing that we've really found out here? That frail patients experience a greater health-related quality of life improvement than non-frail and severely frail patients. So this is the, the group that it really matters to select the right surgery in, and maybe less surgery is the answer for these patients. Um, frail patients were also most likely to achieve SCB for the health-related quality of life measures. So very, very important data there. A note on what AI can't do, however. It does lack true creativity and originality, and this is actually when I entered this into ChatGPT, this is what it gave me. So it's, it's at least sentient in that way. Um, it's decreased emotional intelligence and empathy, inability to make moral and ethical judgments for now, limited common sense and intuition, sometimes the context is lost on AI, lack of adaptability and flexibility, no casual reasoning, limited transfer learning, and there's a reliance on data. So as we get more data, AI is going to, I think, explode and definitely get better at these things. But for now, we still need human operators. Um, so for now, I welcome our new robotic overlords, and I'm looking forward to the future. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, well, no, I, I, great talk. Uh, so um, I'm very comprehensive. I think you went through the whole gamut of... of uh, robotics, like here and now. And I, I was struck by the fact that, I think we all were, that um, I didn't know that breast cancer is eight times more common in orthopedic It's eight cancer. times more common, yeah. So uh, we, we actually started something at our, I was also the wellness director at our hospital. So I now ensure that all of our residents have both the axillary lead and also um, the sleeves that they can use. And that's just, it's not just for, for women, it's, it's for men, anyone with breast tissue, it's, it's fine, gender is a construct, okay. But the key thing is all of our residents do this, right? We've all seen that resident who is literally hugging the C-arm, trying to put in a femoral ear. You're like, why are you doing that, right? So teaching people both how to step back from the fluoroscope, um, as well as minimizing the use of the fluoroscope, I think is going to be key in terms of reducing cancer rates. And that's in my other role also as an oncologist. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I think uh, I think radiation safety and you cannot be emphasized enough. So I think all of this enabling technology, if that the only thing that they do is to make us safer, you know, I think that would be a fantastic step forward. You know, my question that I had for you, it seems like you know you've done obviously a lot of stuff with AI and big data analysis. You know, what I'm always perplexed by is you know, we you know, getting more and more understanding of the spine pathology, mm -hmm. right? But as we all sorry. So, so we're becoming more, you know, better with, you know, identifying spine pathology, right? You know, the different angles, you know, to look at frailty of the patients. We kind of, we have been looking much, many, much more now uh, in our patients at how much they walk, how active they are. 
But, you know, in the end of the day, it's like often you kind of, as a surgeon, you have a gestalt of a patient who you know is going to fall apart. And I was wondering, uh, you know, if there's any inkling and any more information in the medical, neurological and medical comorbidities that we can maybe dissect much better to identify. Because in the end of the day, 80% of these patients probably would just need better bone care, metabolic care, so that they don't, you know, have these issues or need a better neurologist. Uh, and it's probably not best treated with titanium. So what have you kind of learned from the AI, AI analysis that shouldn't be biased in that direction? So there's a, there's a couple of things. Firstly, great question. Um, firstly, they, there's a study uh, in the orthopedic oncology literature that looks at the patient's number one predictor of mortality, like when are they going to die? And it was actually surgeon prediction of mortality, and this patient will be dead in less than three months. So having that kind of data set and actually having surgeons enter that may be something that's really interesting upcoming um, in the AI set. The other thing, and why I think the digital twin concept is so important, is because it doesn't just look at a finite number of factors, right? Like that patient can enter their bone density, blood work, telomere analysis, um, Hounds field units on the CT scan, medical comorbidities. And if patients are willing to provide that data, the more similar we can match patients and we actually kind of have a hindsight interpretation where we can say, okay, like, look, this patient who looks entirely like this person, but the only difference they had is this person had osteoporosis treatment and this one didn't. Can we predict which patient will do better? And maybe we need to focus on, you know, metabolic strength and bone, et cetera. But should that patient have less surgery for now? Or is that patient not optimized for surgery, right? So it's not just a surgical planning tool. It's a healthcare planning tool. Sorry. Uh, so are there any insights already? I mean, have you, is there anything that the AI has told, you know, like have, that you've seen in the literature so far? Um, not, so it's still very early in the state. I mean, we have the ISBC model. Um, we have a couple of things that we're looking at in terms of frailty. I think that's the biggest area of study now. Um, there's some very interesting data coming out with telomere analysis and people who have shorter telomeres are generally more frail and those people may not be apt to do well with spine surgery. You can, you can get your telomeres tested, which is very cool. So, what do you have to pay for that? <laughs> you do have to pay for it. I tried to get, I was like, I'm not paying this. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, thanks, Teresa. Yeah, thank you guys.